Welcome to Native America Calling. From Studio 49 in Albuquerque, I'm Harlan Mikasato. Many of America's ghost stories are connected to Indian burial grounds or sites where Indians were massacred or the spirits of old dead Indians. Across reservations, pueblos, and native villages, there are endless stories of paranormal sightings and spirits haunting various places. On this Halloween, we ask, what is the scariest, spookiest thing you've ever witnessed or the scariest story you've ever heard? Have you ever had a close encounter with something from another world or dimension? Do you believe in ghosts? Join us as we talk about ghosts and spirits right after National Native News. This is the Friday, October 31st edition of Native America Calling. I'm your host, Harlan Mikasato. I remember as a kid, growing up in my little small town, Perkins, Oklahoma, about this time of year, and my sisters and brothers and my cousins from the hood would gather in the dark in the corner of our yard, and we would sit out by the, our old cedar tree and tell ghost stories. And I had one cousin who could who could tell scary stories. I mean, he, he would get all into character, and he would use his voice to make the story really good, really scary. You know, and the other thing is the stories were real. I mean, they they were they were true. At least I thought they were true. When he when he talked about being at Shilako Indian School up by uh, Ponca City. Oklahoma, and, and how the students would hear strange noises and see strange lights, and some of them even saw ghosts or spirits at night. Or he would tell us about deer woman, half deer, half woman, who would, who would show up in tribal communities, at, you know, on people's porches, at their doorsteps, looking in their window late at night, or, or people would see her out in the woods. I mean, it was scary stuff. And I'm sure you've got some ghost stories because, you know, most Native people believe in spirits and, and believe in what's termed the paranormal. And, you know, and when I get with a bunch of Indians and someone brings up a ghost story, you can sort of feel the atmosphere change. And people sort of move up to the edge of their seats and they, they anxiously wait for their turn to tell about that one time when they saw a ghost or something that they couldn't quite explain or, or about the time their uncle or their grandpa or their mom told them a story about seeing a ghost down by the old church or by the cemetery or down by the river or at the old boarding school. And, you know, stories can go on and on all night when you get a bunch of Native people together telling ghost stories. So that's what I want to do. You know, think about that. Well, here we are, Studio 49, got the lights down. We're going to tell ghost stories today. We want to hear from you. Do you have a story about Canyon de Chez or Wounded Knee or Lake Sakakawea? You know, what's the spookiest thing you've ever seen or the spookiest story you've ever heard? Do you believe in ghosts? Give us a call. The number is 1-800-99-NATIVE. That's 1-800-996-2848. And join us today here in Studio 49 is Antonio R. Garces, and he collects and researches ghost stories, and he is the author of 10 books about true ghost stories of the West. You can check them out on his website, ghostbooks.biz, and the books include uh, American Indian Ghost Stories of the Southwest, Arizona Ghost Stories, New Mexico Ghost Stories, Ghost Stories of California's Gold Rush Country and Yosemite National Park, and his latest book is Colorado Ghost Stories. And Antonio is Mescalero and Otomi. And welcome back. To Thank America you. Call. <clears throat> Glad to, have, to be here. Good to have you with us, Antonio. As you know, I've been here before, and every time I've been here, I mean, it's been a, a pretty good experience with having the callers, with hearing their, their personal stories. Yeah, that's what we're hoping for. Again, if you want to join in, if you have a good ghost story for us, give us a call right now. 1-800-996-2848. That's 1-800-99-NATIVE. Don't be scared. 
Give us a call, 1-800-996-2848. And, you know, you, like I say, you've got 10 books out, and your latest yes. one is called Colorado Ghost Stories. Right. And they, they seem to be getting bigger and bigger. Yeah, that's over. There are over 400 pages of uh, research that I've actually done, and they differ than any other ghost books ever written in that they're not stories handed down from generation to generation. What I've done is I've actually gone out and interviewed people who have had firsthand one-on-one encounters with, with ghost spirits. And when you do research, uh, you were telling me that that, uh, sometimes you you go out on the landscape. Sure. And and you were telling me about going up to Sand Creek. Sand Creek, yeah. I don't know if any of your listeners know of Sand Creek, uh, but Sand Creek was one of the definitive um, battles or massacres, most like uh, a better term, uh, in southeastern Colorado in the plains. And uh, I've never been there before until I started the research for the book of Cal- Colorado Ghost Stories. At any rate, I decided to go out there one uh, winter, and there was about maybe two inches of snow in the ground. Again, it's in the plains. As far as you can see, there's nothing, basically, just rolling hills. So I went walking out there thinking I knew where this area was. And as I went walking by myself, literally miles of nothing but one tree. So I headed out towards that tree, crossing over uh, barbed wire fences and with my camera. And it was about 10 in the morning. The sun was out. Again, there was a s- slight dusting of snow on the ground. I'm walking and walking, and suddenly I thought I knew where I, I saw a creek bed, and uh, there was not a sound from anywhere. And so I stopped stopped there, just meditated a little, and then turned around to walk back to my car, which was about a mile away. As I turned around, I started hearing uh, yelling and, like, screaming, literally screaming voices. And I stopped in my tracks and didn't even turn around. I just stood there in place. I literally heard screaming people. And then it, like, faded away. So... About a few seconds later, I thought, this is very, very odd. So I kept on walking, and once again, they started up. Again, this was in broad daylight, and I immediately, from my background, I knew this is something spiritual. So, And, and this is a place where the, the U.S. cavalry, was it? Not, well, it wasn't a cavalry. It was, it was, a, it was a General Chivington, okay. who was more or less like a custard for a little bighorn. Uh, he wanted to m- kill Indians and be make a name for himself. So he got these uh, renegade folk. Okay, so it wasn't the cavalry. No, renegade folk to go in there and get these Indians. Well, he knew, and they advised him beforehand, that there was nothing but women and children, Cheyenne and Arapaho people there. And there weren't any wars, just old people. And they were just camped there for, for a couple of days. Well, he thought, yeah, this is going to make a name for me in the archives so and also history. So I'll just go over there and, and consider them um, a threat and then kill them. Well, not to get into the details of it, but it was a very bloody massacre. Children, bones are still found there to this day, skulls, beads. Portions of the bodies of these innocent people are still found there. Well, what so he here did, you are a hundred years later. At least, yeah. Over a hundred years yeah. later. Walking on this, this sites. Anyway, what he ended up doing is in, through the streets of Denver on pikes, on poles, he actually had the heads of a lot of these poor people, Indian people, on and, and just paraded through the streets of Denver. This is Colorado's history. Not a very good portion of its history, but nonetheless, it's history that can't be denied. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I walked into this um, not knowing all this, really, until after I did the research. But I did see this. And amazingly enough, after I said my my small little prayer to these uh, relations, I heard this screaming and uh, right by me, and I looked up above, and there was a hawk circling around. I thought, yeah. You're accepting of it, and, you know. So it, it, it was it was a revelation for me to experience that. And you've also had some other uh, oh, yeah. times when, when you've uh, encountered uh, something out of the ordinary, I guess. Sure. And um, you know, a lot of people have. 
Oh, yeah. So we're, we're hoping that uh, as people listen here that they'll uh, think of something that they've heard or that they've actually seen and give us a call, 1-800-996-2848. It's, uh, it's Halloween, telling ghost stories. And like I say, you know, when, when I get around, you know, Native people and we start oh, telling yeah. ghost stories, you know, there are a lot of ghost stories out there. So give us a call right now, 1-800-996-2848. But, uh, you know, one of the things that, that uh, when I was growing up, Antonio was that um, we were told about these these, these lights. <laughs> what was that? Did you hear that? Anyway, we were t- we were we were told about these lights. We called them we were called them jack o' lanterns. Yeah, but they were there were these, you know there's always like the strange lights right. that that people would see, and I even saw one one night at, at powwow with my with my brother and cousins on the top of these trees. And it's it's very strange. Have you have you ever seen or oh, heard stories? The, you about know, among Indian people, that's one of the, and your callers might call in about their experiences about this. Uh, they believe that. Uh, well, let me get back to this. Uh, the most common visual uh, manifestations of spirits that Indian people have reported to me are lights, bouncing lights on the prairies, in canyons, uh, on hillsides and mountains, the lights that follow them. Lights that are at a distance in one moment, and then before you know it, they're right in front of you. Uh, uh, lights, the balls of lights that disappear, and in their place is a person. Uh, all of these things uh, relate back to a spiritual aspect of light, a light giving force. Uh, but I'm sure your callers will have their own individual ideas and, and experiences about this. But I know among Apache people, like my grandfather, he also would see these lights uh, bouncing from house rooftop to rooftop uh, in the hills. And they believe that they were the spirits of warriors. That's what a lot of Apaches believe. Now, again, other people, other other tribes might have their own ideas of what this, but this is what I was told they were. Mm-hmm. And the other thing that's become part of uh, American lore, I mm-hmm. guess, is... Oh, shoot. Holy... Did you hear that? <laughs> Well, that door's opening. I know. Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> is anybody? Is somebody there? Oh, it's a Jehovah Witness. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there's there's, there's, there's uh, the part of the American lore when yeah. it comes to ghosts is Indian burial grounds right. or or you know Indian from um, from Huck Finn. I think there was wasn't there an old Indian spirit or something? Yeah, there Huck was. Finn, all the way up to Poltergeist. Sure. You know, there's always this this these stories about Indian burial grounds. You ever hear stories about that? Uh, you know what? Whenever I do lectures, and I do lectures around the country, my most recent I did was in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, but I've, I've lectured across the country on, on my books and the subject of ghosts and the paranormal. And, uh, yeah, I always inevitably will hear people come up to me and tell me their personal stories about their house being uh, built upon an Indian burial ground. Or this hotel is buried, uh, is built upon an Indian burial ground, or, or it's it's inevitable that I'll hear this. Is when I'm trying to get across, and I I always look at this with a skewed eye and think, hmm, if there were so many Indian burials across this country, this nation, this continent, I mean, we would be literally walking over corpses. But I don't. That's not true. I'm sure in some asp- in some cases that is true, but the vast majority of them, I think it's more or less. For uh, it makes for an imagination that that is ripe for this kind of stuff, and they go, "Oh, Indian people mystical. Oh, Indian people buried dead. You know, ghosts, spirits. Of course, you know. No, I personally I don't believe that. But and here's another thing. I I don't. People ask me, "Well, do you believe in ghosts?" And I always respond, "No, I don't. I don't have to believe because to believe in something, it, it's a matter of faith. I don't. I know ghosts exist." So I, there's no question in my mind. They do exist, so I don't believe in them. I know they exist. We're talking with Antonio R. Garces, and he is um, the author of books about true ghost stories of the West. And uh, if you want to check out these books, we've got a link on our website, NativeAmericaCalling.com, right. to your website, so people can check that out. <clears throat> if you have a ghost story to share with us here on Halloween, give us a call right now, 1-800-996-2848. That's one 800 Nine nine native. We've got some calls here, and okay. uh, we've got some ghost stories. We've got Natasha, who's up in Bethel, Alaska, listening on KYUK. Good morning, Natasha. Good morning. 
Good morning, good um Asilagamak to you Hamji uh This is you pick dialect. Um I'm gonna make it really quick, two little quick uh short oh shoot. Um uh, in nineteen nineteen seventy six and you can guess what kind of ghost story I'm sharing and these are true factors of life. Um during the night, uh in my deep sleep, early Easter morning I, you know, when you're in deep sleep and your leg is starting to numb out and so you barely wake up and then you uh, um, move at him so it don't die. And then you go right back to, uh, back to sleep in the uh, deep sleep. And for uh, about exactly three times um, I did that during the night, early in the morning, early Easter morning. And there was a picture of uh, uh, of Jesus and hoping her little children around, and that picture was blessed. We blessed it, me and my brother and uh, his wife. We had a whole bunch of Christmas presents that when we piled them up in one place, and then we prayed, <laughs> we meditated practically half the night over them because we, they were gifts to our family and friends and neighbors. And so I noticed my head slowly turned around, just my head, um, my heavy skull, brain, mind, and I turned around to this brightest light that I'd ever encountered in my life. And it reminded me of uh, the tomb that was removed at, uh, at Easter. Anyhow, that's one, and it happened three times. I don't know, the... the uh, seconds or uh, minutes of intervals in between the, the three times that I woke up and it was on the wall. It was about the size of it reminded me of a tomb that the rock, the stone that was removed. Anyhow, um, and then um, I think it was during the summer I visited my mom's grave and she's my Holy Ghost buddy. Um, well, maybe uh, this was a friend of, my, yeah. friend of mine. I, I'm thinking I that this might have been uh, your your mother maybe perhaps visiting you. <laughs> Don't you think? Pardon? Was this possibly the, the 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 light that you saw a spirit of your mother? A spirit of the Holy Ghost, yeah. Or or, or I'm thinking that more of your mother because you said ghost. you said you went to visit the grave of your mother, right? No, this is that's the it's a totally different story. Oh, okay. It's the story of Easter. It okay. was early Easter morning during uh, while I was asleep, deep sleep. And then uh, the second short a uh, short little story is over a dead body. My mom's uh, grave, I visited her grave and I was sad and, um, um, and she was surrounded. She had created her own um, fence of grass. She, she, her grave was growing beautiful grass. I mean, zillions and zillions of grass and I was so amazed and I, I, it was mystery. Anyhow, I bent over and um, I started to cry, and I was kind of sad because I miss her. I miss her dearly. She's my Holy Spirit body. She's the one that introduced me to my spirituality, and I'm connected to her through that. That um, I bent over and I started, I hit my head down all the way down to the grass and to the grave, and I started crying and. And of course, and um, and all, all of a sudden, a, bird, a whole bunch of little birds surrounded me, and that was the way my mom's Holy Ghost um, system responded to me, and it was beautiful. Hmm. It was gorgeous. It was delicious. Anyhow, and just the other day, I was cleaning up an 85, 87 of uh, year old man's humongous house dusting and everything and mopping and then just before I when I was at least four and a half hours of non-stop cleaning I was just turning around and going out to go fishing I was in the village digging for pike subsistence I got 39 <laughs> anyhow I I heard a little bird uh, chirp right around the left my right side and I said oh my sweet lord what is that I, I slowly I stopped I froze and I turned around and I I was going, hey, where are you? Who are you? Talk to me some more. But then um, there was just one chirp, and then I turned around, and I saw the picture of the uh, uh, fake image of Jesus Christ, and I said, wow. oh, I never noticed you were there. Yeah. Hi, Natasha, hi. thanks for your call. Okay. We appreciate you calling well, in this you. morning. 
Okay, let's take another call before the break here. Let's bring in Elliot, who's here in Little Eagle, or who's in Little Eagle, South Dakota, listening on KN, KLND. Yeah, hello. Howard. Hello, Elliot. Hi there. Uh, hey, yeah, I'd like to share a ghost story since you guys are talking about Halloween. Uh, so, yeah, I used to work down to... Um, I used to work down to Marty Indian School down in uh, Marty, South Dakota, and I'd like to share the experience I had down there. Uh, there's, I know i got a lot of friends down there. And, uh, and uh, one night I was on security duty, and I was walking through through the um, through the, the campus grounds, and uh, uh, I came to the uh, the cafeteria, the old cafeteria of the old Marty um, cafeteria, and here I seen a I seen, I seen a young man sitting there. He had on uh, knickers, and he had on he had on like a a sweater and then like a vest, and then and then uh, he was sitting at the he was sitting at the table. Where the where the where they used to eat like that in here? Uh, I sat there and I <laughs> I freaked out because I was supposed to be security guard and I'm seeing this stuff and I I see this guy sitting there he's like you know he's a young man and then then uh, so I, I so what I do is I uh, I look the other way and I say wow hey <laughs> I I look the other way and I say hey this can't be true. <laughs> This is me, and then I look back again, and I see him again, then I look again, then I look again, he's still sitting there. So, um... What did I, he uh, do, uh, Elliot? What did he do? Well, he did, he was just sitting there, actually, he was just sitting there eating in the old cafeteria. Okay. And he, he never looked at me, and when he looked at me, he looked up at me, and then, uh... When I looked back at him, I just got this, like, a eerie, spooky feeling, you So know? you immediately knew you were looking at a spirit and not a human being. Uh-huh. Yeah, I knew I I knew immediately that I was seeing like a ghost, you know, like a Did he have Let me ask you this, did he have a glow about him? Did he smile at you? Uh, no, sm- he just looked at me. He just he uh, you know, he just he he just looked at me and then uh and I looked right back at him and he had on this old uh, the old cafeteria style of um, you know, the how the old kids used to dress on right. like mm-hmm. like okay. like you would see in a in an old black and white picture. Yeah. Uh-huh. And I looked back at him, and then I was like, "Yeah, I don't, I didn't see that." I said, <laughs> I, "I looked away," and then I hollered, I, "I looked back again," and I had to write this stuff down in my logbook, you know, because I'm security. Oh yeah. Well, what so, ultimately happened? Yeah. Well, ultimately, what happened is I got, I got <laughs> shivers up my spine, and you know, and I got scared, and then, and, and then I remembered hearing stories about. From the Marty Indian School days, when uh, there was, uh, you know, like ghosts and stuff like that. Okay. So, um, and yes, I believe that there are spooks, and there are. I, I believe our people are, um, um, you know, they're still down there trying to cross over because of they they've been treated mean, you know, and yeah. and yeah. and uh, I do believe that uh, yeah, there's still their spirits there. They're uh, they're crying for justice yet, you know. Okay. Hey, Elliot. Thanks for your call. We appreciate yeah, you, you betcha, calling in. Hey. Yeah, yeah, okay, thank All right. you. We're yeah. telling ghost stories today. If you have one to share with us, give us a call right now. The number is 1-800-996-2848. That's 1-800-99-NATIVE. And our phone lines are open. We're going to take a break here, tell you what's coming up on Monday's program. <laughs> Although much has been documented about the civil rights movement of the 60s and early 70s, Little is mentioned about the Red Power Movement, when tribes and Indian people came together in a unique struggle. What was the native fight for civil rights all about? I'm Harlan Mikasato. Join us as we talk about the Red Power Movement on the next Native America Calling.
If you're a Native American, there's one simple thing you can do to help your elders, help young people seeking an education, and help develop Native businesses. Your vote on Election Day makes a difference in Washington, D.C. and at home. Vote for our people, our land, and our future. Go to nativenews.net for more information. Brought to you by the Carnegie Corporation of New York and Kiwanek Broadcast Corporation. Alaska Nakmin Yuin Nathan at Nakati Kai Chuka Sucking Vote at Sakamakun Mai November Four Rami Vote at Santa Dizna Nunavut Yupit Yuchak Putsu Vote at Santa Pinechta Chenas Vagalout November Four Rami Pinarit Knachi Vote at Rector Nachtuji Vote at Atau Chiokak Sitting Kai Tulachtut Manna Dayok get out the native votum Jolly Wanak Carnegie Corporation Nakun to New York Ami. Welcome back to Native America Calling. I'm your host, Harlan Makasato. I'd like to say hello to our listeners tuned in to KDLG in Dillingham, Alaska, KEYA in Belcourt, North Dakota, and KGOU, KROU in Norman, Oklahoma, and Oklahoma City. And today it's Halloween, and it's a good time to tell ghost stories. And I'm wondering, you know, do you have a good ghost story to tell us? Do you know of some uh, places on your res or, or somewhere in your community that's haunted? Have you yourself ever, ever actually seen something out of the ordinary, something um, something paranormal? All right, so what's the spookiest, uh, scariest story you've ever heard, or uh, what's the spookiest, scariest thing you've ever seen? Give us a call at 1-800-996-2848. That's 1-800-99-NATIVE. Or maybe you could call us and t- tell us about the, the scariest Indian you've ever seen <laughs> <laughs> or the scariest Indians. Give us a call, 1-800-996-2848. We want to hear your story. Phone lines are open if you want to join in. We've got uh, Antonio R. Garces in the studio with us here. He's Mescalero and Otomi, and uh, he's the author of the books, of uh, t- ten books. Ten and books, Ten yeah. books. The recent is called uh, Colorado Ghost Stories. Uh, you've also you've probably seen American Indian ghost stories of the Southwest with the uh, skeleton Apache riding on horseback with the uh, the big squirrel cactuses and the lightning in the background and yep. also New Mexico ghost stories and uh, you know Antonio what is the what is the the value is there is there any value in in, in collecting these stories and sharing these oh stories? definitely uh, the stories uh for me, are important because they're stories that I seek out for indivi- from individual people who never really have disclosed their story before. Uh, and uh, again, like I said, these are stories that are not handed down from generation to generation, but I focus on people who have had one-on-one encounters with spirits. So, you know, the usual one with the grid, the hitchhiker and all, I stay away from those kind of stories. I like to get sit down knee to knee talking to people one on one and have them talk to me, have them disclose their personal encounters. And a lot of times I'll have these people who I'm interviewing really get animated and really get excited about what they're giving to me. There are times though that I have to say that I've had people actually break down and, and cry because it has moved them so much, affected them emotionally so much. I have to stop the interview and wait till they compose themselves and then continue it on, you know. But uh, the value is definitely important. It's important culturally because there's a lot of aspects to these stories that are cultural, you know. Uh, and in relating to Native Americans, uh, the stories are not across the, the board uh, the same. They're different because you get desert people versus Northwest Coast people versus Canadian versus you know, uh, people who live in uh, swamplands, they all have different stories, very different, I have to say. But nonetheless, they involve spirits, of course. But culturally, <clears throat> there's a lot of things that are associated with these uh, songs, uh, ways to protect yourself, or even in some cases ways to draw them to you, etc. So, mm-hmm. yeah, they're very important. Yep. Let's hear some of the stories. I want to. I'm going to get to the phone lines right now, Antonio. Let's bring in Chris, who's here in Albuquerque, listening on KNN. Chris, Chris, what's the matter with you? <laughs> you all right? Oh, 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 hey. oh hey there, guys. Hey uh, there. 
I, you know, I grew up in a small town called Estancia, south of Albuquerque, and um, I was running around one day. My brother and I were playing in a local neighborhood, and uh, a building on the end of the block was a very old adobe building, you know, with deep set walls. And, you know, I was running and hiding from him, and I was uh, really winded. So I stopped to take a break, and I stepped back into this deep set doorway of the adobe wall. And I you know, was uh, kind of leaning against the door. Well, as it turns out, this place was a, um, a mortician shop, you know, a mortuary. And all of a sudden, I feel like a, a man opened the door from behind me, and I fell into this building. And I looked up, and I saw uh, the mortician and, and, the, and the, the gentleman he was working on. And... Boy, it scared the living daylights out of me, and I feel like it was the the old man that he was working on wanted to, you know, give me an introduction into death and maybe uh, <laughs> and to scare me a little bit. Hmm. It was um. How old were you? How old were you? Uh, you know, I was about ten years old, uh-huh. and uh, <clears throat> boy, it's, I looked up at the mortician. I looked up at the man he was looking on, working on, and uh, you know, I think he was a little bit excited to maybe see his wife after he had passed and uh you know that was uh, quite an experience man i it's burned into my memory forever I never forget that uh, one huh nope i'll never forget that one and i took off like i've never ran before <laughs> <laughs> yep okay <laughs> so All right. anyway chris, chris thanks for calling in thank you Bye-bye. Yep. let's take another call let's go to ellie who's here in albuquerque hello. listening on kunm hello hi ellie hi Hey, um, I know I was listening, and I heard um, Antonio talk about uh, sacred burial grounds, and it reminded me of some of my experiences. Um, I was raised off the reservation, and there was a brief period of time when the family was living in Florida. And uh, there was a, a nursing home that was being built. Actually, the area is Palm City, Florida. And uh, they found Native American bones, and it turned out it was a burial ground. And a lot of Natives didn't want um, the resting place disturbed. Anyway, um, after the big Puhaha passed over, the nursing home was built. Well, there were some years that passed by, and I hate to say it, I had forgotten about this. And then, as luck would have it, I ended up going back there as a nurse, just to, um, uh, a nurse to work the halls of the nursing home. And uh, I worked there about two years, and periodically, it, it was not exactly common, but it was not uncommon either for our little grandmas and grandpas to wake up during the night and say they saw a man or a woman, and when you ask them to describe it, these people who knew nothing about Indian culture would do a very good job of describing a warrior's outfit, you know, or how a Native American was dressed maybe like a hundred years ago. And um, I always told them, well, maybe you're just dreaming, go back to sleep. Well, there was a, a CNA that I was working with, and his he was, I think, part Cherokee, and he told me, oh, you don't know, this is a nursing home that was built on the burial ground everyone was fighting about. And when he said that, it was like, oh, my goodness, they're not dreaming. These people are being visited. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, And then there was... um, But you never saw anything. No. Oh, no, I didn't. However, the doors of this nursing home to the rooms are open and closed on their own. You know, i got to let you know that uh, with all the research that I've done, uh, medical facilities are rampant with with stories like this. If you if you speak with night nurse staff, uh, mm-hmm. you'll find that they always have stories. Let me relate one quick story to you that hey, I've I'm had. A night, night nurse. It's funny. You, said you that are. I am a yeah. Night nurse. Well, and I I have lots of stories. This is just well, I'm one sure of them. you do, and this has been my experience as well with medical staff that they well, it's common. Well, just think of it. Patients are in a position where they're disturbed emotionally, physically, obviously, or else they wouldn't be in a medical facility. So they're at their their least uh, 
uh, vibrant, aren't they? Are they not? So, and even there's many cases where they actually die on the operating table, and there's a lot of sadness with family, etc. So, no doubt there'll be a lot of that residual energy still there. Uh, so, yeah, medical facilities, convalescent homes is another. Oh, I've got many stories related to this subject. And um, what I also oh, what I wanted to tell you about the doors, they opened um, by, and closed by themselves. Sure. I call maintenance because I thought maybe the doors just aren't hanging square. Hmm. And I call this guy several times, and I suppose I was annoying him. Eventually what I found out is the doors, this was a nursing home that took care of the retired wealthy. I mean the very wealthy. Okay, they had their own bank on the premises. And um, what I found out from the maintenance man is, oh, no, all these doors and the walls are square. A lot of homes don't have square walls and floors. This home, the craftsmanship was so picky, the walls and the doors were true square. So it had to be some outside visitors. Right. Right. Okay. Oh, Ellie, it. thanks for your call. We appreciate you calling in, sharing with okay. us. Let's go to Kent who's in Tuba City, Arizona, listening on KGHR. You're on the air, Kent. Hello? Can you Hello there. Yeah, you're on the air. Yeah, good to hear your voice. Um, I'm an owner-operator truck driver out of Tuba City. I just want to, you know, just, I just remember something when I was a little kid and I started hearing these stories that they're talking about. Um, I was going to school in Fort Wingate, boarding school in Fort Wingate, New Mexico. And... Me and these three guys, I don't know if I'll be able to see them again, the Willard and Howard Ashley, they're out of, I don't know where they're from, but we, uh, we decided to go, we were about 10, 11 years old, 12 years old, we, we decided to go to a cemetery which is close, a Calvary cemetery which is close to, uh, Fort Wingate. And we, we got a shovel and we, <laughs> we were thinking, oh yeah, okay, we're gonna dig up one of these graves and, and, uh, See if we can get some metal so we can get some candy bars, you know, cause, uh, get some money because out there in boarding school, you hard to get something to eat. But um, we, <laughs> we walked through the gate of the cemetery. This was about 10, 11 o'clock at night, and we got about halfway up there. We saw where it says Colonel on there. Oh, this guy's got some big metals. Just before we started digging, you know, I guess a gust of wind came by and closed the door to the cemetery. And you should have seen those guys run, man. I was three steps, and we were over the fence. <laughs> you just hurtled that we, fence, huh? Was, we were gone. We ran back to the dorm and just shaking like a leaf. And about three days later, the, you know, that pastor that I borrowed the shovel from, he came up to me and said, where's my shovel? And I, said, I don't know, but you're going to have to pick it up yourself, but I ain't going back over there. Well, well isn't that a twist? <laughs> now, here's a... Uh-oh. Isn't this a twist? Now, oh, now an first. Indian guy is digging up a white grave. Yeah, we, we, that's what we were going to do one day. But <laughs> to get some candy bars. <laughs> to get okay, candy bars. Or not. All, right. All right, Kent. Yeah. I do understand what I wish you, but it's good to hear your voice. Kent, thanks for your call. Yes, sir. Who, who was it? Rita. Yeah, we're getting a candy bar for <laughs> <Yeah>, Rita. Rita. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, we're telling ghost stories. Give us a call if you want to join in, 1-800-996-2848. That's 1-800-99-NATIVE. Phone lines are open. Got about 10 minutes left if you want to join in. Let's go to Andrea, who's in Standing Rock, South Dakota, listening on KLND. Uh, hi, my name is Andrea. Andrea. Oh, well, yeah, you already said that. Um, I, um, when I was younger, about five or six, um, my grandpa, he told us to stay in, but uh, they, they had a, a bunch of rabbits and everything outside, so we didn't listen. We went out, and we seen him coming back down on the hill, coming back down the hill, and we ran inside, and I went to my room, and I looked outside the window, and there was this woman just clear as day, just, you know, face to face I seen her, and I described her to my grandma, and we were in trouble anyway for we weren't supposed to go you know, for the rabbits. Cause what time of day was it? Was it day or night? It was day. Okay. So um, I described it to my grandma, and then my grandma said that that was her mother, and I forgot about it, and then I was telling my aunties uh, a few nights ago that uh, what I seen, and they showed me a picture of her, and they said, that's your grandma. you seen, you seen our grandma. So I was like... Your great-grandma. I, yeah, my great-grandma. Ah. Yeah. You know, it's uh, interesting... People think that a place that to be haunted or visited by spirits has to be old, like an old house, etc. But in my books, I, I report uh, instances of people 
experiencing spirits in brand new facilities, brand new homes or hospitals, etc., buildings. And also people think, oh, you're going to see spirits, <clears throat> they only come out at night and scare you. That's not true, and this is one good case of this example. People will see spirits even during the day, so it's not necessarily you see them at night. But I was the only one that seen her, because I was, like, uh, I was uh, looking for my grandpa, so it just... When I seen that, I got scared, and I told my grandma when I told her that there was nobody outside. And when I finally... And she well, said, yeah, this is one good example mom. of another example where you, we, the living, don't make the decisions necessarily of when to see them. They make the decisions of when they want to appear to us. Oh, well, I, I, actually, it was a very good feeling to me. Oh, sure. I, mean, yeah, I was just really happy. I was scared because of my grandpa. We weren't supposed to be outside, <laughs> but when I seen her... It was a very good feeling. Wow. Okay. Andrea, thanks for your call. Okay, thank you. Thanks for calling in. Let's go to Regina, who's in Flagstaff, Arizona, listening on KUYI. Hello. Hi. Hi, Hi, Regina. Um, I wanted to tell you a few things about um, the last caller as well as about um, what he mentioned about how they don't always come when you want them, you know, apparitions or you know, um, spirit dwellers. And so I wanted to tell you about a story in Monterey County, and I was uh, rescuing some bison. And <clears throat> first I put some tobacco on the land uh, to ask permission if I could go on the land so that I could work with the, you know, spirit keepers and spirit dwellers. And we went to the cemetery because we wanted to um, give thanks and also ask permission to be in that whole area because we went straight to the cemetery so it was at night at about two o'clock and we lit you know a sage bowl and we i had it was another person with me and we wanted to um put tobacco off make an offering of sage and then and thank the spirit dollars there so the spirit keepers so when this um sage bowl was lit what happened was uh I was standing with the sage bowl and my friend was in behind me and um, we put some tobacco down and the sage was lit and it was going and it was a pretty dark evening. So when we started putting tobacco down and saying thank you to Creator and to the spirit dwellers there and the keepers, we saw this from the cemetery, we saw all of this white, all these white spirit, you know, apparitions. They were lifting off the ground and coming overhead. <clears throat> and some of them actually came through, and then this wind started coming, and we and it started getting a little cool, and we started seeing them coming toward us. And as they came toward us, some of them went right through me, and then some of them went overhead. So um, while the tobacco was on the ground and the sage was being burnt, we were just saying thanks. And so one particular um, spirit um, was this man, <clears throat> he's very, very old, and he was hunched over, and he was a white, you could see the, I could see the whole outline of him, and he walked, I said, offer him some tobacco, so my friend put some tobacco out in his hand, <clears throat> and the old man, the spirit, he walked over, and he looked in his hand, and he, he didn't know what to do, I said, just keep your hand open, I'll, just keep it open, and the old man looked at, and then I said, put it on the ground, give it to him, so he put the tobacco on the ground, and the, well, and then he came and walked back to me, my friend, and the spirit, the little old spirit, it was a very old, small, old man, he followed him over, and then we just asked for him to, you know, we actually said a prayer that, um, asked Creator and the, um, that the ancient ones and, and the spirit dwellers that were there would uh, rest in peace, and that those who can ascend would ascend. You know what, I have to say that your experience, what you just ex explained to us, uh, <clears throat> is a very interesting and very insightful type of behavior. If you look at the different types of ghost uh, programs that are on the television and cable these days, a lot of them will 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 aggravate spirits. They'll cuss at them. They'll in order to get a reaction from them. They mm -hmm. they'll disrespect them. But you are are one of the the best examples of how. You don't have to do that in order to get them to come to you, if you want them to come to you. You you are showing a lot of respect towards them, and that's what I do. In other words, 
Here's another thing that I do personally. I don't, whenever I go into places that are supposedly haunted, I say supposedly because I don't know for sure until I'm actually there, um, I never, ever cuss at them. I never, ever agitate them with words, n negative words. If they want to manifest, they'll manifest. But you always give an offering also. I never refer to myself as a ghost buster or a ghost hunter. I think those are very derogatory, and they set the tone for negative things that will happen there in the future. But I think what you did was a perfect example of what everyone should strive for. Thank you, and that's why I agreed with what you said to the caller earlier, is that you can't, you can't summon them. They have to want to come, and if you do an offering. And you're right about the, um, the shows and the recent people who are ghost busting or ghost hunting or trail blazing and trying to find, and, and it's like a foot race, you know, to find the, the most fit spirit-filled, you know, buildings, but really the respect is what they need, and they're there, and they're dwelling there for a reason, and it's more about helping them to ascend and to um, create a possibility to open the gateway that they can enter so that they can be released, and we, you know, because there are, I believe there are spirit, spirit dwellers and, and our ancient ones and our, our, our angels, and there are ones on earth that are here to help and assist and aid, but there are ones that are here that have no choice. You hit on yeah. it. Yeah, you yep. definitely hit okay. on that. Regina, thanks for your call. Thank you very much. Yep, let's go to Steve, who's in Fort Hall, Idaho, listening on KISU. Hello, Steve. Hello, Harlan. <clears throat> I have this story, uh, old story, about a, uh, a young medicine man that had the power to go to the other side and come back. And one one early morning, you know, the hunters were gone, and he was the, he was the only kind of like man in the village. And this this uh, cavalry came and. This this cavalry jet, uh, uh, general wanted his nephew to uh, lead the charge, so he put his nephew up there, and and and, uh, and uh, they they attacked the village, and uh, Ivy Hanna stood in front, and uh, the young guy pulled his saber out and cut Ivy Hanna's head off, and his head went rolling, and and uh, and then after that, you know. That cavalry guy would go back to his uh, barracks and stuff, but he would see he would see something all the time, you know, coming at him, as rolling. And one one night he was laying on his bed, and there was something on the window, and he thought it was the wind. And he opened up his window, and there was Evie Hanna looking at him, but it was just a head, a rolling head. And 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 after that, now the younger people. They uh, when they're, when they're uh, playing outside it's evening time and it looks like there's kind of like a small ball rolling up the hill around the corner. They say, "Oh no, it's Ivy Hanna!" and they run run back into the house where the lights and where it's safe and they uh, and it gets dark. All right, Steve, thanks for your call. And yeah, you know when we talk about ghost stories, mm -hmm. uh, Antonio, yeah. uh, a lot of times you know we used to hear about the the witches who lived. Uh, across the road and and not to be out at night and not sure. to be too far away uh from the house at night so a lot of times there's 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 those stories sure. for for children exactly that are just made for children right, right. or right. invented for kids right yeah. right okay let's take another call let's bring in william who's in radisson wisconsin listening on no, I, wojb hi Hello. Um, i used to live in uh um, silver lake in kenosha county uh, wisconsin on the fox river I always had bonfires out there, and it was one night. It was uh, late fall, and it was warm out, but, the, you know, uh, the water was kind of cold, so I had that mist. And I'm looking on the other side of the river, and i seen this warrior on a, on a horse carrying a staff, and the horse was painted, and he was all painted up, and he stared at me for, gee, about two or three minutes and just vanished away. And I don't know what that means. Well, uh, you know, in my Colorado Ghost Stories book, the recent one that just came out in March, I have an example of something like that. Uh, with this one guy experienced, he was uh, driving across country, and he stopped in the Plains area of Colorado. And he saw in the distance, he climbed up to this butte, and he just wanted to take in nature, I guess, during the day. And he saw in the distance some movement, and as it got closer to him, he noticed it was... Uh, uh, about five or six horses with Indian people on them. And they just came by and, and, and passed underneath the butte and in full view of him. And then this was again during the day, and then suddenly they just disappeared. So, 
Yeah, there's examples of this, not mm-hmm. only humans, but horses, animals as well. And I, w- and I would imagine, too, uh, William, that, you know, along that Fox River, there's there's a lot of uh, people that are that are buried along that river. Most likely, yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I happen to have gone to college there in Wisconsin in Whitewater, and I remember a lot of the different stories I used to hear there from fox and sock people. Yeah. yeah. Um, I got one more quick one. Can I say it? Uh, you know what? I, we're almost out of time, William. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate it. Okay, well, thanks for right. uh, listening to me. We should just do a uh, Ghost Stories Part 2. Let's do it. <laughs> I'm ready. It doesn't have to be Halloween. Four but, times, five we, times a year. Let's do, do it. it. Next full yeah. moon. Next full moon. We'll oh, every it. full moon. <laughs> All right, thanks for your call. Let's go to Honey, who's in Ignacio, Colorado, listening on KSUT. Hello. Hello. Hi. Well, I'm going to give you guys a quick story, okay? And this is one what my cousin told me. Okay, a long time ago, she and her boyfriend were going to Fort Duchesne. And what happened was is that she, her and her boyfriend were going to Vernal, and they were in Fort Duchesne, Utah. And they were driving a long, long road. And she said it was very dark and late, and she said that, you know, they didn't want to be traveling that late, but they needed to get home. So when they went, they said they were going back to Fort Duchesne, and they said that um, they were listening to music and talking and stuff, and so they went and turned off the music and were talking. And, you know, they were just talking amongst themselves. So when they were going, they saw something standing in the middle of the road. And so her boyfriend told her, maybe it's somebody that needs a ride. You know, they can get in the back and, you know, they can just ride into town with us and get off. And she told him, I don't think so because, you know, I have a bad feeling about it. Well, as they kept going and the lights were going, he hid as bright so that the guy could see that they were coming up. And when they got a little bit closer, this big old thing, he said it probably had been like six foot or a little bit over, turned, and he had like a, like a cover. And when he came up to him, this thing turned around and looked at him and had big yellow eyes. And when she said she looked, she said her heart started beating and he started beating. And, you know, they just kind of stopped the truck and looked. And when he looked, it was the biggest owl they have ever seen. Yep. And this thing, like, just jumped up in the air and took off. And she told him, turn around, turn around. So they went in the middle of the highway, turned around, and just drove as fast as they could. Well, when they were doing that, this owl was following them. And then, you know, it flew right in front of the truck and was right beside him. And then she said that she didn't know what to do. And she said she had, you know, right. Honey, was just saying her quick prayers real quick because she didn't know what was going on. But this thing was just so big. And she yeah. said never to travel in that area way late at night. All right, honey, thanks for your call. We're nearly out of time here. Antonio Garces, thank you for joining us today sure. on Native America Calling. And uh, want to be sure to give out the website. Okay, it's www.ghostbooks. Dot biz, or you can Google me, my name, Antonio R. Garces, G-A-R-C-E-Z, or you can find my books at Amazon.com. All right. And you can check out the link on our website as sure. well. Sure. All right, Antonio, thank you for joining us today. Happy Halloween. Thank you very much. <laughs> How do you have a happy Halloween? You can uh, have a happy Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> you have a happy Halloween. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. All right, that's going to wrap it up here today on this Friday, and want to uh, thank our staff again. And also... Uh, just tell you, you know, thank our listeners for tuning in and calling in and making this a good show. We'll be back on Monday. Native America Calling is produced at the studios of KUNM in Albuquerque, New Mexico by Kiwanek Broadcast Corporation, a Native nonprofit media organization located in Anchorage, Alaska. Funding is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the Ford Foundation, with additional support from the University of New Mexico. Music is provided by Brent Michael Davids. Visit us at NativeAmericaCalling.com. Native Voice One, the Native American Radio Service.